The year is 1942, and the race for atomic power is underway, for electricity or for bombs. Countries compete to advance their understanding of nuclear fission faster than anyone else. In the summer of 1939, France, the United States, and the United Kingdom were the first to construct their own attempts at fission in rudimentary setups called piles. In 1940, Germany began their own work, close behind and quickly catching up to the other nations. The work of Germany will be lost to history, but at the height of this year, Germany will cause the world's first nuclear accident, itself also forgotten to time. This is the story of that day and everything that led to it. This is the story of the Leipzig L4 experiment. When the Leipzig project was started, Germany had only suffered failure in the race for nuclear power. The first experiments began in Hamburg, trying to create a chain nuclear fission reaction. Every attempt a failure. This wasn't their fault, of course. They lacked a good moderator to slow down neutrons and encourage a chain reaction. Heavy water was the first choice, but they had very little, so they used dry ice instead. Their uranium was impure, and the amount they had was also extremely small compared to other countries. They achieved little. Another attempt was made in Berlin, using two tons of sodium uranite, stolen from imports from Belgian mining operations in Africa. The uranium was again far too impure to fission, and the experiment failed again. As a side note, these African mines would later become the source of uranium for the Manhattan Project, but the Manhattan Project is a story for another time. This leads to the third attempt at nuclear fission, at the University of Leipzig. There are three people worth mentioning here. Robert Dopel is the first, a nuclear physicist working at the university, who had been invited in 1939 to explore the possibility of sustained nuclear fission. The second person is his wife, Clara Dopel, who wasn't officially a member of this small circle of nuclear physicists, being a lawyer term physicist, but worked with her husband without a wage. The third person is another professor at the University of Leipzig, Werner Heisenberg. He was Dopel's counterpart, the professor of theoretical physics, and another member of the small circle of physicists. But back to the reactors and the first Leipzig experiment. All four experimental reactors share a similar design. Four layers, two of uranium oxide and two of water, constructed in aluminium spheres, with an access tube that protruded out of the top. The entire structure was sealed by rubber, and then submerged in water. The first attempt used regular water in the structure. When it was submerged, there was no effect on the neutrons in the reactor. Dopel tried again in early 1941, creating Leipzig II. This time, they used heavy water instead of regular water, and again the results were failure. But they knew they were getting closer to fission. They just needed more. In the late summer of 1941, the two Dopel workers, as well as Heisenberg, created their third reactor. Again, a similar design to the first two, but with only enough uranium oxide to fill one layer. Yet again, it was a failure, but the scientists knew that they were close to success. As Heisenberg would later say, it was from September 1941 that we saw an open road ahead of us, leading to the atomic bomb. How he could be certain, nobody actually knows especially given the lack of safety in the Leipzig piles and the other experiments across Germany. No control rods were used, and the reactors would effectively be allowed to run away if something went wrong. This is in direct contrast to the likes of Enrico Fermi and other scientists in the United Kingdom and the United States, who were very careful with the safety of their piles. The reason for this is simply mind-blowing. Heisenberg believed that the nuclear chain reactions would eventually reach a maximum temperature of about 800 degrees Celsius, and therefore there was no risk of a meltdown. For comparison, temperatures in the Chernobyl and Fukushima meltdowns would reach as high as 2,255 and 2,800 degrees Celsius respectively. The melting point of uranium is 1,132 degrees Celsius. This lack of safety would be made obvious in December 1941, when a technician was filling the aluminium sphere with yet more uranium oxide. The uranium oxide was impure, and therefore pyrophoric, meaning that it can ignite spontaneously when exposed to air. It did just that, and the entire hemisphere of powder caught fire. 
The technician severely burned his hand, the aluminium sphere was destroyed, and the team had to go back to the drawing board. We have finally arrived at our destination, Leipzig 4. Again, a similar design to Leipzig 3 and its predecessors, a series of spheres encasing the fuel and heavy water, which was then submerged in a water tank, with the access shaft protruding from the top. This time, however, they exchanged the fuel. Instead of using uranium oxide, they opted to use pure uranium powder. More than three quarters of a ton of it. All of this uranium powder and heavy water was encased in just an 80 cm diameter sphere of aluminium. Still very little protection, still very little in the way of dealing with anything that could go wrong. But they had success, at first. In early June, when they shot neutrons into the small sphere, to their amazement, more neutrons were leaving the pile. To explain how this happens, a quick breakdown on nuclear physics for those unaware. When neutrons are collide with very heavy elements such as uranium, they can become unstable and fall apart, creating smaller atoms and releasing more neutrons, as well as creating energy. This is called fission. When the scientists detected that more neutrons were being released, this meant that fission was occurring inside the sphere, the first time they had managed to do so. There was no risk of a meltdown, however, as the sphere was small and the amount of fission was minimal and not self-sustaining. However, the group planned to create a much larger sphere using 5 tons of pure uranium and 10 tons of heavy water, which could sustain a nuclear reaction, but would have also likely led to a meltdown. But thankfully they never got that far. Their results were published in secret scientific articles among the small circle of scientists, and they were heralded as heroes. For now. The date was June 23rd, 1942 and workers were conducting yet more experiments of Leipzig 4 when a sudden stream of hydrogen escaped from the water tank that the reactor was submerged in. The stream didn't last long, and the researchers continued their measurements. After the experiment, however, Robert Dopel and the same mechanic who burnt his hand under Leipzig 3 decided to open up the reactor. What they had assumed had happened was that water had somehow found its way through the aluminium and into the uranium. Water and uranium, especially in powdered form, will react to form uranium oxide which releases hydrogen, which is what leaked out of the sphere. All they had to do was open it up, clear out the uranium oxide, and then reseal the aluminium. Now, some of you may remember what happened to Leipzig 3. The uranium oxide ignited when exposed to the air and destroyed the aluminium sphere. Well, the exact same thing happened here. Within three seconds of opening the aluminium seal, the two men heard the sound of air rushing into the pile, and then the uranium oxide ignited. Flames shot out of the machine, and they had to abandon it, in the water. Again, we shall pause to discuss the properties of uranium. Uranium powder, like uranium oxide, is also pyrophoric. It can ignite in the presence of oxygen and water, even at room temperature, releasing more hydrogen. And now, Dopel and his technician have left three quarters of a ton of uranium powder in a small room with plenty of water. The uranium will continue to burn, reacting with the water to form uranium oxide and hydrogen gas. Temperatures continue to climb. With no alternative, Dopel and the mechanic fled the room and called Heisenberg for assistance. The fire was still burning by the evening when Heisenberg arrived. He barely had time to inspect it when he was forced to flee the building, as the temperature rose to the point the hydrogen ignited. The explosion tore the spheres completely apart and shot the uranium powder six meters into the air, scattering it about the building. The uranium powder, or not already alight, also ignited, setting the entire building ablaze. Some of the uranium even partially melted, scattering radioactive contamination throughout the entire building. Firefighters were called, the building burned to the ground, and nothing could be recovered. The failure of Leipzig L4 ended the uranium programs at Leipzig. The German nuclear program would transition away from weapons to energy production, all of which would fall apart by 1945. Werner Heisenberg would eventually call for international scientific cooperation and moves for peace, having seen the devastating impact of nuclear weapons. In 1976, he passed away as a result of kidney cancer. 
Robert Dopel lost Clara in a bombing raid in Leipzig and was kidnapped by Soviet NKVD at the end of the Second World War and assisted the Soviets in the development of Russian heavy water production. In 1957, he returned to East Germany with his second wife, the widow of a Soviet officer, and became a professor in Ilmenau, where he focused on climate change. He passed away in 1982. A large amount of information about the Leipzig accident remains lost or classified.